Okay, this is a substantially different venue from my 8.30 a.m. lecture. There's more beer, uh, people are more awake, um, and hopefully this will be a good talk. So um, I chose the title Duck Dynasty uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, the first being I feel like I personally am part of a dynasty of ducks. So um, I grew up uh, in North Dakota, and I came from uh, a family that was avid sportsmen. So both my mom and dad were duck hunters, and so I grew up from age 11 on in the field, in the marsh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings, um, hunting ducks. And like many professionals in our field, that was what really got me hooked on waterfowl as a species. Um, but beyond that, uh, I, I guess I had a leg up because my dad was also a, a PhD waterfowl biologist. And so not only was I learning about ethical and responsible hunting, but I was also learning about you know, marsh management and the shorebirds and all the various species that, that you see in the marsh. And so that really is what, what got me going into wildlife in general, but certainly waterfowl specifically as well. So fast forward, um, I guess about uh, 10 years, uh, I graduated my undergrad from Cornell University. I worked on songbirds like so many of them do at Cornell. And then I went straight to a PhD program at UC Davis uh, where I worked on ground nesting waterfowl, mallards and gadwall, and how uh, their nest success and nest spacing is driven by predator behavior and things like that. So, after grad school, I went to University of Delaware for a postdoc, again, on, unsurprisingly, waterfowl, um, and then uh, started at LSU in 2014. And so since I've been here, you know, it's been a real privilege to carry on an education dynasty at LSU as well. So I stepped into the shoes of Dr. Frank Rower and Dr. Al Afton, who were here for decades. Um, and they passed through dozens of graduate students and published more than 100 scientific papers. And so I have, I have some, some big dynasty shoes to fill here at LSU. But the best part of my job is, is this table right here, these undergraduate students um, who come through the program and I could get to try to instill my passion for waterfowl um, into their lives. And so we do a lot of hands-on activities. We go duck banding and duck catching and go out into the field and get muddy in the marsh. And, and that's really sort of what our program is all about. Beyond doing the science part of, of duck teaching, um, we also do um, a hunt program. So LSU is only one of two universities in the country that offers a student hunting opportunity. So um, every wildlife ecology senior in our program, if they want to, can go through hunter safety. I'm a hunter safety instructor. We do it in-house. And then if they complete that course, we will arrange for them to go on a duck hunt. Um, those duck hunts are provided by uh, private individuals who have access to really premier duck clubs. And so they donate the guides and the time at the lodge and things like that and really provide a tremendous opportunity for our students. And it's not, we don't do this so that we can turn all of LSU students into bloodthirsty duck killers, right? That's not the point. Um, these are wildlife majors who are going to be getting jobs in wildlife-related fields. They're going to be working for LDWF, um, other state agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and a lot of the people that they will be interacting with are hunters. Um, and a lot of actions that they'll be doing in terms of managing habitat uh, is to the benefit of game species. And so, in my mind, it's very important for them to have the worldview of a hunter, so they need to get into the marsh, see the sunrise, hear the ducks come in, right, in order to be able to interact meaningfully with those stakeholders. Um, and so that's what the hunt program is really about. So that's sort of where I come from as a person in terms of my dynasty, um, but we're also here to talk about Louisiana's duck dynasty. Um, and from that perspective, um, the, the picture is not quite so rosy. So uh, Louisiana, like many other places in the country, has a pretty dark legacy, um, going all the way back to the market hunting days, which started from you know, uh, European settler colonization up through about 1900. And, it was, I won't say that waterfowl populations were nearly driven to extinction, that's probably an overstatement, but the declines were alarming. Um, so in, you, it seems like this would not be uncommon, right? So the 250 ducks on this boat um, would be worth somewhere around $2,800 in today's money. So these hunters would go out into the marsh, there were no bag limits, no species restrictions, and then they would over harvest these waterfowl and sell them in markets in New Orleans and Boston and San Francisco and, and places like that. So 
Thankfully, um, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, we had some important legislation passed by some forward-thinking individuals that ended, um, ended market hunting effectively in 1918 with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, it, it defined which species could be hunted and not, um, and set a path for regulations and restrictions going forward. Fast forward to the 1930s, and we had some, some other pieces of national legislation that provided a funding mechanism by which managers could secure habitat to ensure the waterfowl resource in perpetuity. So I'm talking specifically about the, um, the Duck Stamp Act. So in order to hunt a duck legally anywhere in the United States, you must possess a federal duck stamp. Um, it started off at a dollar, um, it's now at $25. And over the course of that program, it's raised $800 million for waterfowl conservation. Um, pretty non-trivial. And then the second piece of legislation was a few years later, um, the Pittman-Robertson Act, which uh, moved uh, an existing tax on firearms and ammunition and directed it to the Secretary of the Interior, and that money is also used to fund waterfowl habitat uh, conservation. That's contributed about $12 billion since its inception in 1937. So waterfowl science sort of slowly grew. Um, we learned more and more about populations and drivers of demographics and things like that. And then it really coalesced in the 1980s with the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, which is uh, a strategic vision for doing comprehensive waterfowl conservation across the North American continent. And that plan has been revised every 10 years. The latest revision was in 2015. And that is the overarching document that, that guides conservation science to this day. And the successes have been, have been enormous. So since the inception of the waterfowl management plan in 1985, we're talking on the order of 16 million acres of grassland and, and wetlands that have been conserved. So waterfowl, the true dynasty of waterfowl emerging from market hunting has been one of, of conservation success. And in fact, this is um, a flagship example of a successful conservation and management of a game species that's used worldwide. So here we are today. Um, in present day, uh, Louisiana is, well, the Gulf Coast, Texas and Louisiana is responsible for, for overwintering 15 million waterfowl. Um, and that's the goal set by the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an important recreational sport here. So in any given year, we have 80,000 hunters that are harvesting a couple million birds, and that is far more than any other state in the United States. Um, if you scale down, there's some years where Cameron Parish harvests more ducks than the entire Atlantic seaboard. So this is a major recreational activity in our state, and it generates a lot of money on the order of $120 million in economic output every year. And that's guns and ammo and dogs and guides and boats and hotels and all of that, right? And so what's nice about waterfowl hunting, like many forms of tourism, is it, uh, it redistributes wealth from urban areas to rural areas. And so all of the wealthy bankers and businessmen from Baton Rouge and New Orleans are spending their money in Venice and Cameron and are, are redistributing that wealth to the local community, um, which I think is pretty important. And more than anywhere that I've ever been, uh, waterfowl are are part of Louisiana culture. If you go you know, south of the interstates at any time between November and January, someone is be wearing camo and talking about duck hunting. Um, but you see it on LSU campus. This is the only campus I've ever been where the students are walking around in camo, right? That, you don't see that a lot in the Ivies. I'm not just saying. Um, so, um, so more than any other place I've been, this is embedded in Louisiana culture, right? Um, but the ducks are only here for part of the year. The rest of the year, they are elsewhere, right? So where are they coming from? Thankfully, we have good scientific data on this. So when uh, most of our ducks are coming from an area called the Prairie Pothole region, um, which is this area of, of South Central Canada and through the Great Plains, um, we know that that's where they come from because when waterfowl are, are before they fly south, they're banded with small metal rings. And then when they're harvested by hunters in Louisiana, we know where they came from, right? And so this prairie pothole region is extremely important for our waterfowl here in Louisiana, which is why even some of the money that, that our state collects from hunters and, and other sources is sent back north to do habitat management up there. Because if we're not protecting where the ducks come from, they ain't gonna be known ducks down here, right? Um, so I'm from North Dakota, um, and it's, it's a gorgeous landscape in the spring. It is 
by far my favorite place to be. When you have a wet spring and all of these so-called potholes fill up from snow melt and things like that, it can support a tremendous number of ducks. Now it's very important that we keep these wetlands separate because ducks are territorial about their little puddles. So you can have a mallard on puddle A and puddle B, but you can't have two pairs of the same species on the same pond. They just won't tolerate it, right? So, so when we see factors like wetland consolidation in Prairie Canada, taking some of these small wetlands and consolidating them into larger wetlands, that's bad for ducks. Um, these little potholes are so exceptionally important that we go out of our way to monitor how many of them they are. So this is a, a map showing transect surveys. These transects are flown by biologists from US Fish and Wildlife Service, Canadian Wildlife Service, and various state agencies. These transects cover two million square miles of the United States and Canada. Every May, biologists get in planes, they fly these transects, and they count every single wetland and every single duck that they see, down to species. This is the longest running and, and largest scale ecological vertebrate survey in existence. And so we have amazing time series data that would make most, uh, most bird biologists salivate just seeing a time series of population data covering the entire North American continent from 1955 to 2018. Um, so your eyes are probably drawn to these um, dips, these low points, right? Um, those are drought years where productivity is lower and the ducks don't have as, as many places to settle. And what we've discovered is unlike the days of market hunting when certainly humans were decimating waterfowl populations at unprecedented scales, is that duck populations now Hunting is regulated and managed sustainably, and so the number of ducks that we have in the fall flight is, is driven by productivity. Um, how many nests hatched, how many of them are eaten by predators, how many ducklings survive hawks and minks and things like that. So there's, there's an extreme focus on studying waterfowl productivity because that's what drives populations. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can study waterfowl productivity. Uh, like I said, I did my PhD work studying nesting ecology, so monitoring duck nests, how many eggs hatch, how many were eaten by skunks, uh, how many did the Vietnamese guy steal for the fermented duck egg stuff, right? Um, that, was, that was something that happened. We had a boa that got into eggs. Um, so there's a lot of things that can destroy duck nests. Uh, but at the broadest scale, if you really want to know how well ducks are doing, you can simply count how many mommy and daddy ducks are there and how many ducklings they produce, right? That is your coarsest scale measure of waterfowl productivity. So a group of ducklings is called a brood, and so we can measure something called the brood to pair ratio. When it's high, that means productivity is good, right? We have more ducklings per unit pairs than in a worse year. But the problem is, ducklings are pretty hard to count. So how many, how many ducklings do you see in this photo? That's a, sort of a rhetorical question because this is just a wetland photo. I don't know if there's any ducks here. Um, but the point is that there could be and you would never see them. Um, so the way that you do brood surveys is you send out a bunch of technicians on the edge of the wetland with binoculars and they try to look for duck broods. Okay, well, you can't really see over a really tall cattail, and as soon as you show up at the wetland, the ducklings scatter into the vegetation, right? And you can't see them. And even if you do, there's no way that you're gonna be able to count them or identify them to species, right? And so this is, we're really good at counting ducks. We do it from airplanes all the time, right? But, but this is not effective. So some of the fancier statistical modeling that we've done indicates that we're probably seeing less than half of the broods that are out there. And so this is one area of waterfowl science where we are not doing a good job. And if we're trying to estimate productivity, then this is clearly a major research need. And so this is, this is where my team comes in. Um, we are taking to the air. Um, we are using unmanned aerial vehicles uh, to, or drones to survey duck broods. So I have a graduate student, Katrina Terry, who's working in uh, North Dakota and Minnesota and then a graduate student, Jacob Bouchard, who's working in South Central Canada, and they are using these drones to fly over prairie wetlands and try to identify the duck broods that are there. Um, that's pretty cool, but they're still really hard to see, and they still dart into the vegetation, right, where they're impossible for even an overhead camera to get a picture of. So we are using um, thermal imaging cameras um, to, to monitor duck broods. I feel, with this mic, I, I should be doing this in person, but that was me dancing. Um, 
So these thermal imaging cameras uh, detect heat, and they detect heat relative to the background. So you want to be observing, say, a warm duckling on a cool pond in the early morning, something like that, is when it works really well. Um, and so this is what it looks like. So we approach these ducks from about 100 feet in the air. Um, we're just flying over wetlands looking for hot spots, basically. And so this is uh, footage from, from Jacob's drone. And so you can see there's a water control structure here. And so he's slowly uh, lowering down an elevation. And eventually, you'll be able to make out which one is the mother duck and which ones are the ducklings. And so this is a wetland that had a cattail wall that observers couldn't see through. And even if they could, they would never spot this duck in all this vegetation, let alone be able to count all of these ducklings, right? And so this is technology that, that really opens the door for doing some pretty cool duck science. I mean, you can not only see that there is distinctively a mother hen, but you can count all the ducklings. Moreover, you can record the video and then bring it back to the lab and make sure that you did it right. Um, as opposed to just sending untrained 21-year-olds out there with binoculars and hoping they count the ducks right. Um, so simultaneously, we can actually then s dynamically switch to a visual camera. So we can use the thermal imaging camera to get an accurate count of ducklings. And then we can use the visual camera. And if you're really good at your duck ID and you zoom in to identify them to species. So this is a blue winged teal. Um, we had a, a session in lab group where we all gathered around and put them up on the PowerPoint and decided what species it was. So there's a little bit of un uncertainty um, in this, especially in photos such as this. But, but the point is that we're able to do things that ground observers could never possibly do um, and with, with unprecedented precision. Um, here's uh, my final example. So this is, um, we're only about 20 feet above the vegetation here, and the, the mother and the brood of three are lit up like a Christmas tree on the thermal, but you can't see anything on the visual. They're right in here. So they're totally hidden. Um, and interestingly enough, um, there was a paper published literally today um, from one of my friends in Europe who was using a drone like this. I didn't know that Hanu was doing this, um, but he used only the visual camera and found that, meh, it wasn't really that much better which is good because otherwise I totally would have been scooped because you just published this thing today. Um, but so we can do it better with the thermal camera. Um, so here's the only data slide that I have. Um, these are results from uh, Jacob's and Katrina's work. And basically, it's what the statistics told us before. We see twice as many brews with the thermal camera than ground observers do. And so our estimates of productivity have been way off. Um, and so this is really is kind of a game changer in how we do waterfowl science, just because we can see things that were previously in totally invisible. Um, I will also say that it's pretty helpful for finding nests. So um, some species of ducks nest over water. They nest, they build up a, a bed of cattails, and they're in these really thick, choked up wetlands. And the best way that we've been able to search for nests before now is you send technicians out with literally a yardstick, and they randomly wander around, whacking the vegetation, hoping that a duck jumps up. Right? This is preposterously inefficient. Right? And, so, and you get really hot and sweaty in the waders. And so the drone, right? so um, you all can see the nest here. And Jake is hovering above the nest. And these guys are trying to find the nest that he's texting them about. Um, and even though they're six feet away, they have no idea where this nest is. You can see these trails that are made through the cattails, right? Um, well, a major predator of duck nests in this area is ravens. So what does a raven see when they're flying over these wetlands? A bunch of trails made by researchers that go straight to the nest, right? And so um, there is a possibility that simply by the act of discovering a nest that we are influencing its probability of being destroyed by a predator. And so part of Jake's project is monitoring some nests remotely only by the drone and some nests where the observers are going into the nest to see if there's a difference in survival. Um, we need another year of data. He's got another, year of, uh, another field season to go, um, but the results should be pretty interesting. And then the last, the last thing I'll say um, before I take questions is that this, this technology is good not only for ducks but for other animals, especially those that eat ducks. So... Predation drives nest failure. It's 
coyotes and foxes and skunks and raccoons and badgers, these mid-sized mammals that are eating all of the duck nests. And so we're not able to survey those very effectively. They're, they come out at night, they have large home ranges, uh, you can use camera traps kind of, but we've never had a good way to survey them. Um, so this is a video of a hot spot that we saw in a farmer's black dirt field in Canada. And we saw this hot spot from a thousand feet away. And we had no idea what it was, but it clearly was a something. Um, and so we went over to investigate. Um, no reaction, dropping lower, trying to figure it out, until all of a sudden, it looks like a coyote, right? And so the, detect the sensitivity is such that we can not only see the hot and cold parts of the coyote, right? The muzzle is very warm, the fur on the back is very cool, but we can see the warm ground where it was bedded down for the evening. And so when it starts to walk, you can even see the footprints where it, the feet punch through the cold dirt that's being cooled by the night sky, punch through to reveal the warm soil underneath. And so we've even tracked moose this way. We'll find the moose tracks before we find the moose, and then we'll follow the moose tracks to the moose. Um, it's, it's sensitive to detect um, things like uh, field mice from about 200 feet away, and you can drop down and see the field mice eating. So this is technology that can be applicable to a wide range of systems, um, and we're collaborating with some ecologists in Michigan to do moose and crane surveys, and things of that nature. Um, so, so I will mention that one of the goals of this initial work, because this is the first time that anybody's ever done this, is to actually monitor and measure the responses of these animals at various elevations so we can recommend best practice guidelines for researchers going forward. So I am not advocating for harassing coyotes at low elevations, because this one is pretty sure he's about to be abducted. Um, <laughs> these drones are not quiet, and when you're at night, they have a red flashing light that can be seen for five miles, so um, he's not really sure why he was woken up early. But eventually, he'll decide that this is probably enough. And off he goes, out, out. And then right here, there's a killdeer that flies or something. So we're able to even see you know, a, a bird the size of a hamburger bun at 250 feet. So, so this is technology that, that promises to, to revolutionize not only the duck world, um, but other areas of vertebrate ecology as well. I mean, anything that's warm-blooded, if it's against a cool background, these thermal imaging cameras are pretty promising. Um, there's a lot of red tape to deal with in terms of FAA regulations and permission to fly over various types of ownership of land, and that's probably only gonna get worse before it gets better. Um, but as long as you can navigate a lot of those, those hurdles, um, this is a pretty promising avenue of research.